Okay, so you're not here, you can listen to my boring talk for another hour if you want to. I know some people used to do it because I think they're on YouTube, you can do it with a higher speed, so you can cut out some time. Yeah. How we can find you on YouTube? I think if you search for my name, uh, there, there is a link from the Mondo page. I I would guess that if you do, uh, I probably say, if you search for, I don't know, uh, is my name? Yeah, yeah, you find it. No, this is something else. Uh, no, you will not find it. Uh, KB7004, maybe? No. Yeah, here, the second one. That's it. No, you don't see it, sorry. Yeah. So if you search for KB7004, it should be some channel that's called into. I don't know. It's, yeah. I don't know so this is the address, yeah. But if you search for KB004 and well, mathematics, you find the files. I think there's a channel here somehow that you can do also. Okay, so I mean, it should be there. and. Uh, Everything should be in Mondo. It's not so easy to find things in this Mondo page. It's always, it's a bit, uh, for me, it's a bit confusing because things are in different places. But all the slides should be there. The slides from yesterday, slides from today, slides from last year, which are basically the same. Yeah, some modifications, all the exams, everything should be there. So if, and uh, so yes, and it's also uh, I used some email system that sends you emails. So if you, whatever email address you have to log into this top university that's the way that your mail will go to. So if you have any information that is urgent, that was used that one. I don't know if you can change it, I don't know, but make sure that you somehow check that mail also. So that's something, for most people, something four letters or four numbers and then the S-U-S-C. You can forward it. Yeah, you can forward it somehow. But it's, so that may, may, make sure that you somehow, in some way, check that mail. And I guess that, so how many people have programming experience before? I mean, I don't Four, five, okay, bye bye. So I will talk, so that this is very, very much over you, but it, so this is not that you have to learn it, but I will try to show a few things. And I guess the idea of this part of the course is not to make you fantastic programmers, but if you, be, if you learn it's fantastic, but it's at least have an idea why we don't do things by clicking and uh, using a mouse all the time why we actually try to do something else. And uh, I will give a little bit of a history about programming a little bit and, and show you a few examples of things you can do in Python. But then you will have 10 labs where you do it yourself, so you don't have to memorize these things. But it, it, there are some fundamental concepts if you've never programmed before that you have to at least start thinking about how to make a program. And uh, of course there are program classes for five year olds also, so it's not so hard, but it's there are a few things that are good to know. So there is, I mean, I g printed out a, uh, for today this primer on Python life science. It's a bit of how ha ha people use in life science. But then also there's an okay book. For, it's not fantastic, but it's, uh, Pasteur has a chapter book to, that, that we do the labs from. That is aimed for biologists. So what is programming? So most of this is from some other people I've used slides from. So this is of course, um, as someone pointed out, a program is some kind of form to system for describing how you make computation, how you calculate something, not just numbers, but how you do something in a way that a computer can understand it. And uh, computers, at least in traditional ways, start to change, are, are very linear. They do things all the time. You tell them, do that, do that, and that. And they're very good at doing things exactly. But they're not, you have to tell them exactly what to do. And uh, normally you have, on the process, you have quite a limited amount of things you can do with it. And, and, and the real instructions you use are extremely 
a hard to work on, but it, it is a uh, machine readable code. That's actually what the computer does, and it's so that's like an in this machine or in the PC is an x86. So that's very sets of restricted instructions. They're getting mu they're much more complicated now than they was 20 years ago, but still quite limited sorts of things you can do. And basically, there are things like take this piece of data, add them together, put them there, or take this um, go do a comparison of these two data and say one if they are the same and well, not one zero if not. So there are, there are things that you just very mathematical things and then also very few data points. You have to move data around and things and uh, do some calculations on this. Traditionally the limiting factor was always the calculations. Really that you had like the, to add things together and this is why you have a CPU has, has one gigahertz so if we can do one billion calculations per second that order. But nowadays, because computers get faster and faster, a lot of the problem is actually to shuffle data, to get the data, if the data is on the hard drive, or if it's in the memory, or if it's somewhere else in the web, there's very, very different access times to it. But, and, and, but anyhow, this computer-readable language is very hard, machine-readable is quite hard to program in. You can do it, but it's, you wouldn't write a big program because it's very inefficient. So that's why you write the computer programming language. It is something that is more... Uh, uh, so basically you set up a plan, so you, you, have, so you have a computer language here, which is some kind of an interface between your plan to do something and what the computer reads. But, so before, but before you start, you need to set up a plan. You need to divide in things that can the computer can understand, and it's not like uh, let's go and eat some apple, uh, pick up some apples and compare them to peers and see what the difference is. It's like, okay, an apple, take a photo, define what the, uh, what we should look at the colors, compare the shapes. So it's going to be very, very strict. Uh, and then you set up a plan and you write it in your computer language, exactly what to do, step by step by step. And then of course, it's a big problem is also testing. Because of course your plan might be wrong and your implementation might be wrong. So often it takes maybe 10 times as long to test it that it actually works and actually does to, to write it. You, always, you didn't think about things comparable. But anyway, if you are stuff with a good plan before, you often faster later. And then you have to put it into, into a computer and actually see that it works. So what, what, what kind of, this computer language, what kind of data points and things can we put into it? What do we have? Basically, we have more or less just these four type things. We have variables. So this is something, a variable is something that stores some piece of data. So you can think if you have an Excel spreadsheet, it's one point of this spreadsheet. This is the data. And the data can be of different types. It can be a number, it can be a string, it can be a matrix of numbers together. In uh, modern languages, it can be much more complex. It can be an image or something like that. But ca classically, it's just numbers, strings, characters, and these type of things. And numbers often you divide into integers or to floating point numbers because they are computers deal with them differently. So this is something that has this is a piece of data. You can do some calculations on this. So you can take two strings, two, two variables, A and B and add them together and they get an X. Of course, this is obvious that it works if these are numbers, if they're strings, it's not so obvious what you mean with that. But you can, of course, take strings and put them together and make a longer string. You can make a sentence. Or you can do something else with the string, but you normally just add things together in that case. But you can do you can do some kind of calculations. Of course, you can do other things. Also, you can do minuses and multiplications and etc. And some of the things like are the things you do are really implemented in the computer, so like the simple calculation, but if you want to do a uh, logarithm, it's most of the time not implemented directly in the computer, so that's the computer has to run a small program to calculate logarithm. So then you can compare if x then y. So basically you make a comparison. Uh, so say for instance if x is larger than three, then I print y. So you make a comparison or something. So you can make comparison of numbers, you can make comparison of strings, you can compare um, 
Yeah, it makes, it makes it also if something is bigger or smaller, if they're the same or if they're different, etc. etc. And then often you have loops or something, some, some things. You can loop over things. You can you want to do things many times. So we in, in the genome world we have many genes. We want to do the same thing for every gene. We want to start with gene number one and then go to gene number two and then to gene number three and we want to do something. And then we then we have a loop over all this. And these are some kinds of four is common word is wide or something. But basically of course you can you could do this with an if statement if you also have some kind of good to it, so jump statement, but this kind of go to statements people are in all programming languages they were very common. They are very rare nowadays because they get very messy. It's, you get very easily confused. So often you do loops like this instead. So, so basically with these four types of operations you can basically do any program and any program you want to write. And this is more or less what the computer does also. It is has a very limited set of variables as well, but it basically can do all these things. But in the programming language, you can do it. You can have more complicated variables and more complicated calculations. It's already built into a language. So why do we want to do programming? So any ideas? So why why do we why do we want to make a presentation here without a program? We couldn't do that. But you want you uh, by partitions do not write PowerPoint. Well, we use PowerPoint. So why do we want to do by programming mathematics? Particularly, one of the major reasons is to avoid repetitive tasks. One of my students, when she finished her PhD and they went working in a biology group, so they did a lot of experiments, she, she said, oh, these experiments took for take time, but they also produced a lot of data. And then they wanted to make comparison of all, all this data, so they had some program that run that, it was a web program, you can click and you make a nice plot out of it. But for the first three times it's okay. But when you want to make 250 of this comparison, this clicking, even only four clicks, it's kind of painful. So of course she wrote a small, small program. It took her probably 10 minutes. That makes these plots automatically. She just prints them out and you can like look at them and you can look at them one by one. And just this is like the amount of, it's probably saved day you work for someone else by writing this program. And that's one thing. The other thing is, so that therefore takes work. The other thing is actually, now you have something which is, uh, you can test. You, most likely, you haven't compared the things in the way you want. You want to do something else. You want to do normalize it another way. You want to add things together. And you just switch it like that, and you have a new plot. Uh, so, and so I always try to convince my students to basically write complete pipelines. You start with your data and you end up with a plot. And it's they always say, oh it's a lot of work. It takes some work, it takes much more time to do the first time than the one one one. But in nine times of ten you want to change it to some other way later. Or you want to use another data set or you want to use something else. So you always almost always gain time of having this automatically all the way uh, running it. And also someone else can use it later, etc etc. But it is just you save a lot of boring tasks that can be, and you can put your energy into actually important thing, which often is the analysis, trying to understand how things work. And of course, nowadays there are large data sets there's no way you can handle by by hand. It's like, in a, as I said, for thousand dollars, you generate 60 or 30 times three gigabytes. So you, and, basically one terabyte of data from a, from a sequencer for thousand dollars. So for each dollar you spend on an experiment and it's one gigabyte or so one billion nucleotide sequences. So, and there's no way of course you can handle it because I mean, it has to be, every, all this has to be mapped to the genome, you have to look at differences, you have to look at the probabilities that are wrong, etc. Et a lot of comparison, there's no way that any human person can do it. So you need to have, you know. so, of course, you could use a program that someone else has written to do it, but you also uh, can. Uh, but you also often you need to have this integrated with other things that you you that are you can use just you need to use yourself. So basically, you, if you want to analyze this, you need to use some 
programming. And if, because you are the one that's going to analyze it, because you are the one of the most developed questions, you need to do it. There are graphical interface things that are becoming better and better, but even these often require some programming. And basically, as to handle the data, you need to have pipelines to handle it. You know, one thing is about partition is that you make web services for making it easy for other people to work. So a lot of things you do is web services. Both to communicate with other, other web services, but also to present our methods for other people. And all this requires some type of programming. Okay, so next question is maybe what is bioinformatics? Uh, so that's the mathematical, statistical, computing methods that solve biological problems. And say using DNA and amino acid sequences and related information. So this is first one way to do it. Another way to do it is, is, is actually more, more computer science point of view. If you want to use computers to store, retrieve, analyze, predict composition, structure of biomolecules. So this is kind of a bit of a historical view of bioinformatics. Nowadays, it's for much of it is, is to get to diseases, get to genes, get to what, what is. Um, a classical problem now is, is basically these very, very large studies of genome sequences. So can we say, what is it that makes these types of cancers common? What are the unique features that you pick out in these cancers that are different from other types of cancers? How can we learn, use the data to learn to get, treat these cancers better? Can we, why is this family getting cancer all the time, but not that family? Or can, we, can we say which, which families get cancer? What people, what is the mutation doing that? And that is not a single mutation here and there. It's often very, very complex integration of many, many different things. So, and just because of the raw amount of data, this is getting actually, even for program techniques, this is getting difficult because yes, we have so much data. We have probably more data than most other fields. And, and in, in particular, if you look at astronomy or high energy physics and that, you have a lot, lot of data, but it's more uniform. This is extremely complex data because there's a lot of things that you should weigh together. So a lot, lot, lot of the problems now in biomedicine are how to integrate the things together. Okay, so back to programming. So history of programming language. So this is ADA. So this was one of the first programming languages. Uh, but of course, in the, in the early, early, early days, you did machine coding. So you exactly tell exactly what the computer should do step by step. So the computer has a central pro processing unit nowadays. Well, most times they have it, and then you can tell it do this, do this, do this, that. And, if, and, and this is just ones and zeros. So it's like any computer thing. It's just ones and zeros. You can have an instruction that makes means that. Assembler was basically is just a way of direct encoding the ones and zeros into something which is symbols. So that is also basically identical. And then the first one, the first thing was ADA, which was I actually never used. So I don't <coughs> know what it looks like. But then in the 60s, 70s. There was development of human readable languages, languages that were very close in the concept to the assembler, but they actually had much more flexibility. So they are very basically the fundamental things for everything we do today. So they, they still C is still very much used. Fortran still exists, but it's not that much used. But C is very also very it's very easy to write what is called compilers that take the C code. Well, not very easy, but it's, at least not extremely difficult and make assembly code out of it. So it's quite close to it. So if you want to write an efficient C program, you have to think about what is the hardware under it a little bit. And the good thing is that you actually can think about it. You can actually tune your program to be extremely efficient, extremely fast, which is harder with other programs that are more uh, object-oriented and are more complicated. But the, the difficult part is it's not as useful. You have to also, you have, you have limitations to it. So the next step really was what's called object-oriented languages. In basically, instead of dealing just with simple variables, you deal with objects, which can be complex variables, and you can do things with these. And this is basically what everybody uses for, in one way or another today, in 
writing programs for a Mac or for an uh, for uh, iPhone or for uh, Android, something like that. There was uh, some type of object around it. And these are quite similar. So C++ is the first one. And I still, I still have colleagues that use um, C++ and bioinformatics quite a lot. Java was for a long time what was running in your browser, and I was crashed with my browser. So that's in the C sharp, and there are, I think Apple has a new language out there. They are, they are quite similar. There are details that make them different, and there are advantages of, of uh, some over other. And, uh, but in general, they are very good for writing graphical things. They're very good for writing complicated big programs where many people write different parts of it together and so on. So if you want to write a word processor, it's perfect. You should do something like that. And it's usually a good library for it. However, in bioinformatics, they are not that... There are things written in, but it's not that common. It's actually... Most bioinformatics are probably programming some of these, what we call more scripting languages, which are... Uh, in some ways, simplified languages. They are actually they, they skip a lot of the complexities to get started that you have. At least you had in these in the beginning, but now they still have it. And you can just start writing on the command line directly. And they are also very good at handling text. That's almost designed to handle text. Uh, in particular, we, we, we will learn Python, which is a modern script language, which has some advantages over Perl and maybe Ruby. Also, you can, you can, you can make it work, work be quite fast. In general, these methods are quite slow because they, are, they, take, they need time to they actually read the code we write it all the time. While these other programs compiles it first, makes the machine read by executable, and you then run. So it's, it's but it's much easier to start. And you are a lot of bioinformatics software out there that you can use, and you can it's not tools you can use it. And Python is very nice. Syntax, slightly different from most other languages, but it's, it makes programming looks nice. And it's also, so, so, but, but still not give you use Perl, you know, give you use Ruby anymore, but, but still there's a lot of Perl people out there also. So that's Perl is more, probably, but it's, I think more and more, basically most of my students use Python nowadays as the main language. There are also other Related, like people do things in MATLAB, people are using R, it's also a more statistics tool that is actually is made for making statistical analysis, but a lot of good bioinformatics tools for it also. So there are, there are alternatives, but Python is not a bad choice if you want to start learning things. One thing that is coming is that we have, of course, we, is the internet. I mean, we all know that the internet has been around for a long time and it's not a passing um, thing. But also in bioinformatics is getting so important, quite important, because data is so big, so there's no way you can have all the data on your own computer. So you really need, and it's getting worse and worse, it's really, it's really needs that, I mean, if I want to do something, uh, one of my colleagues wants to do something, there's a database with every, with many mass spec, experiments done. So basically you do the mass spec, you use to identify proteins, you do a spectrum, and people deposit the data in a database. Not everybody, but most, most journals require that. So they have thousands of these experiments. And he wants to get this data and do some new calculations on it because he thinks he has a better method to do it so he can reanalyze it. He wants to do it in a better way. And the calculations are not that hard. I mean, if once you have the data, you can probably do it in a couple of weeks. Or I mean, it's not that difficult. The problem is that getting this data to his computer is basically impossible because it's just, even if we have a universe, we have fast internet, and it's ter but it does terabytes of data, so you have, it would take weeks to download it. So the best thing, the best way is probably actually to buy a hard drive, put it in the envelope and send it by mail. And then you have to convince someone to do it, so it's, that's practical. But, it, so, but that's, there are a lot of things you actually only can do when you close your data, and it's getting more and more like that. So that's something to think about. Not for this course, but if in the future, it's like, where is the data? So that's, um, so often they are getting much more things we actually, instead of saying, okay, I get this sequence file and I do some work on it, I actually use the methods there that it do, to do work there. But then, of course, you're limited what they have access to. So, so, do you know what a bug is in a computer program? Who knows what a bug is? If you make a mistake in a computer program, you call it a bug. Do you know why? Do you know why, actually? 
Anybody else knows why? If I remember correctly, the first uh, one of the first mistakes which they couldn't find a solution to, they opened the computer and inside they found the literal bug inside. Yeah, they found a moth. Yeah. In panel F in relay something, relay number 70. So, this, so they basically yeah, they, they tried to solve the problem. It was a problem, but it didn't work, it didn't understand why. And suddenly, yeah, they found a piece of a bug or a moth. So that's what is the claim. So, this is the, I don't know what date it is. This is the 9th of September at 3.45 p.m. They found and they started multi added tests, started cosine tape, and a big tape running cosine calculations on that. This, had a, this is somehow in the 50s. So that, that's a bug. So after that, the word bug exists in errors in computer code. And they always exist. And they always take time to find. Mm. I don't know what they do, really. It seems like they are those calculations, yeah. I don't know. Probably at IBM, if I remember correctly. So this is also like another history of computers and programs. So you're like, hey, this is Fortran. This is what I this program is many years. It started actually in 1957. Which is, uh, but you see, it's, it's like a, my, one thing is that it's, it's made for, you know, at least the real one, it's really made for the old uh, um, uh, what's called in English, uh, the card readers. You have, and so, it's, so it's very dependent on what position in the line you have things. It's like the code should start at position 7, I think, it's not in this one, it should do it. And if you have a C in position 1, and that's common, so it's like really it depends on the position in the columns. So, so there still is a number of actually databases files, like like the PDB, which is the proteins database that has protein structures, that is very strict. Uh, in column number 5, you should have the type of amino acid or type of atom, in column number 9, you should have so it's very, very strict, exactly how you do things. Which also was very good. The card reader is very easy to read. It's a pain nowadays because of what things get. I mean, one problem is that I found a bug in the French co co code because he, he had been doing extracting something from his database. The problem was that he had only read three out of the four columns. So when the number of the atom, I guess, or the residue maybe, got bigger than 999, he lost it. And it's all down the zero again, so, then, so he, will, he missed everything else. And of course, some of course, once it's created, this tape, it didn't think proteins could be, could be this big, but then now they are. So they are, they are all problems. So now, this is a stupid way to do things nowadays, but it still exists. And it's hard to get rid of. Similar language with COBOL, so for a while, well, in the year two millennium, you basically, if you were a good pro COBOL programmer, you could make a fortune. Because then you had to fix the Millennium bug in all the old computer code, so there's a lot of still old software running that, at least it was. BASIC is probably the first language I learned, and that's basically a simplified version of Portland, which is slightly more flexible. And it was running on by the Apple II or whatever, the Apple II is another machine. Um, and uh, it's the, and then C, I mean, so this is kind of language, C is kind of the code for many things on it. You see they have this parenthesis that you basically, instead of having here, you have like one line, one thing here. Here you, actually, you, you don't really care about the line so much. You care about really have parenthesis when you start stop things and all, or a semicolon. So you need to have markers. You can have things going on to several lines. But you could do that in Fortran if you, at least Fortran 77 in the later version, if you have put something in column 6, then you can continue the next line. So there's a lot of, like, there's a lot of mistakes you have made because of many things. And uh, the, but, but the C is actually still used. Pascal, I don't, oh, I guess I was using, I don't know. It's like what I learned at university, but uh, I don't really know why, because I never use it afterwards. I guess the C++ and sorry, all at 83. So that's basically uh, what's basically everything in Microsoft was using for long So everything, and anyone who wrote a program for a Windows machine use C++. And still use program. And actually has developed quite a lot the last few years. It's become much better. So there are a lot of good tools nowadays around for it. Perl is was for a long time the, the, the key for everybody from additions. It started in nineteen eighty seven, but it was probably not started by important by before the year two thousand, I mean. 
And the thing, the real thing is like these programs here, you need to compile. So you need you write the code program, then you run another program that makes it to an executable, and then you run this executable. Perl, you just run as it is. You can start typing it and it does things. And it's very, see, it doesn't care so much about the variable types. A lot, lot, lot of things are much simpler. You don't have to include those things in the final things. You get very easy to get started. On the other hand, it's hard to write something that's really, really fast. It, it can, can be very slow. Python is similar, but with very different syntax, and it's actually more flexible. It's in, easy to interact with other programs. So, so here, they're easy to write fast code. But it's, in the idea, it's very similar. And Python is taking over more and more. The only problem with Python is that there's a Python version 3 that nobody uses. And it's been out for five years or something like that. But Python, I think it's 3.4 or something like that. But everybody's still using Python 2. 2.7. So if you download Python, make sure you download 2.7, not 3. There's something similar to called Ruby that some people use, I never used, but PHP is just something special for uh, uh, for basic web services. Facebook seems to use it. I think they did in the earlier days. And it's basically very, very, very similar to Perl in syntax. Java was Sans, which is now again bought by Oracle. Uh, it's a version of C++ that was made for running on the web, and it, so it has some good of the, uh, few tricks that makes it better than C++. On the other hand, it's often much slower because it doesn't compile all the way around. And I personally, whenever someone starts a Java program on a web browser, it always crashes. I hate it. Okay, now there are Java programs for uh, uh, looking at the molecules. You know, I think they are very unstable and always crash. I don't really know why. It's, it's a pain. The only Java program that really works is, is Minecraft. Uh, JavaScript is basically very, very short. It's also very common use for that's anything that runs in your browser, basically. And if you do it real, like Google can do it, so if you run the Gmail clients, this is what program in your browser. It's extremely fast, extremely efficient. And our developments. So this is actually a very common thing now. But it's, in mathematics, it's only used in the web service, basically. Ruby on Rails is some other version that on Ruby. I don't know what it's supposed to say here, but there's something else. But there are a lot of... And this, this was, I guess, in 2011, popularity. Java and C was C. Right? This is popularity in uh, some, some tests. Java, C, C++, C Sharp, which is Microsoft version of C++. No, C Sharp is Apple's version. No, 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 no that's uh, Microsoft version. PHP, Objective C is Apple's version of C, of C++. So it's still, if you look in general, these programs are completely dominating. If you look at biomatics, you will see Python and Perl. That's the main things. Most people use. So one thing that happened here in, uh, well, 83, is basically the C++. And that's, they use definition of object-oriented languages. The first ones, there was something called Eiffel, there was uh, small talk, so in the mid-80s, and there are lots of different versions of it later. And Python is, is a bit object-oriented. Uh, so the idea is basically that what, what, what you do here is that you, instead of having exactly defined, uh, that you can do things on complex objects. So you can take and you can, do, so you can take an object which could be, uh, by, in biomedics, it could be a gene bank entry. The gene bank is a database I will talk about tomorrow, I guess. And it contains information about gene. It contains the sequence of force, but it also contains what, what, where does it come from, many other, many, other, many other features. So there's a lot of features about one gene. So you have one gene bank entry. And so that's what we want one object. So say that you, for instance, want to save it in a certain format, you write save gene bank entry dot face fast a, which is a format, and then you then it's saved in that format. But you, and you want to save it in another format, you say dot gene bank, you save the gene bank format. If you want to uh, run do a search form, you just say dot search. You can do a lot of things with the whole entry. You don't have to um, tell that you Okay, I want to have the sequence of this entry and doing this and this. So you can do a lot of things with this entry. But of course, you need to spend, when you write a program, you need to specify what all these different things are. So that is really the way that you can make much more complex programs together, and particularly if you have many people working on the same program. 
because they have a lot of things you can reuse. And th this is important in Python here because there are a lot of bioinformatics. There's a bioinformatics or biology toolbox, in, you can call it, in, in, in um, Python that actually can do a lot of things uh, that is, will be, take time to write. In particular, you want to run a program, you want to run blobs, which is a program for searching, you want to take the results, and you get the results are maybe lists of other genes, then you want to maybe print these genes, and you can do this in like a few lines, and because someone else has written all the code for you, and it's written in a way that is actually very useful. So this is something we should use as much as possible, but we don't really have to bother so much about it, we can take it as it is, and use the tools that people, other people use, uh, other people have developed. Okay, programming for bioinformatics. Um, so we have uh, one thing that we actually are. So this is a bit of how our bioinformatics work. We are using uh, Unix machines. Hardly anybody I know use Windows for any programming extremely, I mean, they sh certainly exist, but people use Windows for presentations and things like that, but hardly anybody does programming in Windows. Not because it's bad, but it's, they, they really, that's not the common trend in, in bioinformatics. Particularly, you, wa you want to be able to do the same things on your laptop as you want to do on the big $5 billion cluster that you have somewhere. And they are on Unix, and they are, they, the Windows idea there is it exists, but it's very hard, hard to get to work. So really, have some knowledge. So some, I guess, in some of the first labs here is going to be to have some knowledge about Unix. But so actually, Mac are running Unix in the background, so that's easy. And also, there are. You can get to work on the on Windows machines also, but it takes it's more and more effort to install it. You need to install more things yourself, and, and the Unix box is very easy. Often, in my mind, it's actually the important thing is actually that you can develop things fast and then, then, then actually, then, then you really need to run things fast. There are, there are of course, a lot of exemptions, a lot of projects you need to be run fast, but what you do as a programmer is often to integrate different tools. And also, you spend more time really analyzing data and generating data than so more of time writing the program than you actually do running it. So, of course, everything you work, works. But there are, there are cases where you really need to speed up things. but you. The fast development, you have toolboxes that you can make things that actually write code fast is, is important. And a way to achieve this is to use other people's code. So basically, this is what we're doing by in Python. We use code that other people wrote. And this is done by the open source movement. So basically, basically the idea is that people share code with each other. So there are a lot of, and this is academia, and it's not really that much money into it. So. Um, it's becoming the common trend in bioinformatics that most source code that is developed is open source and freely available for everybody. It, this is there are different cultures. If you go to more the chemistry field, not the biochemistry, but more the chemistry, so like the more organic chemistry or quantum chemistry and things, like that, that source code is often not. At least it didn't used to be open uh, open source. But in in, in biology, it's basically impossible. There are a few companies that make money that have their own software, but there are quite few and they're not making a lot of money. So basically, it's, if you want to make a lot of money, it's, it's a difficult field. A big problem will be handling big data. This is really the chance for the future of mathematics. How are we going to handle the data? And this is a computational problem. Not so much the calculations, just, hand, just the amount of data. So the order today is getting it takes time, you have to download all the sequence data, it takes a lot of time. That's why you need to have interoperability between databases. And this is a large, to a large extent, a political problem, because really you need to define what is an object in different ways and you have to be able to, to uh, define it. So that, that's... Um okay, so just a few words before we start. Um, uh uh, the tutorial, or maybe actually we let's take a break and we take we be back here at eleven o'clock.
Okay, so I'll let's have a 15 minute coffee break. Mm, yes. Yeah, I mean, it depends what you want to do, but there, there are depends on what GPU you have, and it depends on. You, I mean, GPU can't do everything. No. So, but but for there the, 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 the is a library called something uh, Qt or Python, Python Qt or something that you can do. So you can I mean, so, so whatever you can learn. You, you, I mean, for the t type of tasks that the GPU, GPU can do, you can do it. Yes. I just have to find my my slides, my, my film. Uh, So why why should we use Python and why do I teach it here? Well, I mean, partly because it, main reason is because it's becoming very popular in bioinformatics. So it's like sometimes you should not think too much about what what is best, but you should just do what everybody else does, which is stupid sometimes. But it's in, a, in this case actually I mean, many things actually in, in in computer it makes sense because just the sheer amount of work put into something really helps uh, really helps people I mean, develop the field so even if it's not the best things to start with but just if you have tons of people working on it it's going to be the best but it also some good reason also it's a script it's, it's a script language means that it's a very fast to start it's quite easy to learn it is object oriented you can, you can do very complex things just in a few lines of code if the object is written behind it it's widely used, uh, and it, but, you, but it's also you can make actually fast code. As uh, Therese asked, it was um, can you write using the GPU? Yes, you can use the GPU. So you can write very fast uh, calculations using your graphics pro processor. In uh, there is a, ob a module that you can download and use it. And we I even have a paper about it. Not that one of my students did. So we did some fast comparison of the structures. Using GPUs, using Python. I would guess that we really would have written it in, in C. We could have made it a bit faster, but most likely not a lot, because the, the part that actually do the calculations are very efficiently implemented. Mm. So I will just do a very, very short tutorial here about based on basic Python things. Hopefully I will have time and hopefully my internet works so I can show you how things work here. That's all of you. But this is what you what you will do on half of the labs basically the next four weeks. So you will have time to learn it. And uh, yeah so this is basically what you do. You will have your you get some problem specifications. So you will get a problem you should solve. And then you have to design and think about well, how should I solve it. I mean, how can I make an algorithm to solve the problem? So how can I ha make an algorithm that can separate a dog from a cat? A classical difficult problem that is not so easy to do. Or how can I make an algorithm that uh, uh, finds all the homologs to my gene and prints them out in a nice diagram? And you write, then you write it and you test it and then you write, send it there and you're happy at the end and you. Ideally, also you make when you write this code, is you make some comments in it so other people can use it later, and you can, or at least even at least you can remember what you did six months ago, which is not always that frequent that people do. But it, it, it's a good, it's a good thing to write comments, but nobody does. One of the nice things uh, with Python is actually it's kind of elegant. It's really. It forces you, I mean, it limits your freedom to write the code to look like how you want. If you write a C, you can write one, one character per line and you don't have to bother, but you can write it look extremely ugly. But in Python, exactly how where you put things and how you, 
and every line is, is very important. A bit like Fortran that way, that we have to put things in the, in the fixed positions. And that is limits, because if you put things in the wrong things, things will go in the wrong position, things will be, uh, things will not work correctly. But at the other hand, if you do things correctly, you can easily follow your plans. This is particularly if you do a loop, so in, in, in most other languages, you have like some parentheses of some type. And so this is start a loop, and you do something, and you end with another parenthesis later. And you don't really matter how things look in between. In Python, you have this position in the line that is important. So if you have a loop, and then you do an indent, you put another tab, or you do another three more spaces, and then everything should be lined up there, starting that position. And then may, often people do that in, when you write other languages also, because it makes it easy to read, it makes it easy to follow, and you can look at things like that. But they're not here you're really forced to do it. So it's, it's quite different syntax from most other languages, but it actually makes it look nice, and it actually probably minimizes number of bugs. Uh, another feature which is general for this kind of, uh, what? Uh, for all the script languages, it's basically you don't have to bother about data types so much. So basically, you have data types, so variables are very important. So you cannot do the same things to an integer as you can do to a string or things. So if you have a string of letters and you want to add it together, you don't do the same thing as if you add two numbers together. And actually, floating points and integers are also different, etc. But in most script languages, you don't, so in most traditional languages, you define that this is an integer, this is a floating point number, this is a string, you define it. But in, in this script, script language, this, this is one of the things you don't have to do, the computer do, do it for you. And uh, that makes things, or actually in Perl, basically what it does is that it thinks that everything is strings, and then it tries to turn it into numbers when you can to. But in, in Python, it's more powerful, you really actually does make things into and uh, numbers and flow the points etc. So it's uh, quite it gains some speed in this way. Another actually important thing for bioinformatics is, is the string operators. So basically often in bioinformatics we use text. We have regular expected and then a sequence is a text string. So often you actually do things that are text. You want to take three amino acid letter uh, code or turn to one amino acid letter code. And this is actually some of the things are really strings are often more problematic to work on with in C or C because they are not or at least in C. But in, in the object oriented language they are really made almost for the micro so and particularly how this was called regular expressions. So you can say, I want to change all capital I's to small i's, you write in one line. And these things are actually quite useful for just for bioinformatics, but we work so much with C. So basically, well, this is a bit old. Script language is actually is actually useful for bioinformatics because often what it uses to glue big programs together. together. If you need a program to do a lot of hard calculations, you will write it in C or C++ or something like that. But for things to integrate with things, Perl, Python, other script languages is perfect. And Python is, Python is much more robust than some other Perl is. You can write nice Perl code, but it's actually quite difficult, and most people do not. So now, how does Perl program look like? Uh, so, uh, well, you have a comment, you have a header, often you read, ideally you should start with this. No, but, well, some people do, but I don't. You have a description written by date, create, loss, modify, so you know what you're doing. This is you do in every program. But, so, but basically this is a hash mark, hashtag here that basically says this is a comment. And this is similar in most languages, but then sometimes there's another letter there. Um, we could just try to... What is one I can turn off? Uh, let's see, see, so we start Python. Hmm? It's written down there. Oh, there on the bottom, that's why. 
Yeah, she's also Python 2.7, otherwise things don't work. There, there are Python. Um, actually, ideally, I probably should try to get this one up here so you can see the same thing. Okay, so um, if I just want to assign a variable, I can, for instance, type a equals one, and the variable a. I should be able to make this uh, bigger. So I can type a equals 1, and then type a, and then this is, says it's 1. I can type uh, b equals that. Now so b is a string, and just look at that. So a, and then I can do, uh, there, are, there are still some limitations. So I can type a variable. There are some limitations. There are, It must start with letter or maybe an underscore. You can't have a you can't have a variable start with a number because that think something else. It, it actually depends on the case. So if you have a, a I am with capital I, it's not the same as I am with a, with a minor I. So this is that you can, there are a few reserved words. You can't use something called and or not or things like that. There are there are, there are functions. Um, there are some conventions that people use. So, Uppercase letters are used for constants, so basically you use something that, if you want to write find pi, that you use all the time as, a, as, as something that is, uh, when you want to use pi, you, you type pi with capital letters and you define 3.1415, etc. Uh, often you want to have meaningful multiple things, so you can either, use, if you want to have something that is an aligned sequence, for instance, you want to align underscore sequence or align sequence like that. Instead of just going to X, Y, Z, because it's in the long run, sure, it's a bit more typing, but in the long run, you know what you're doing. I don't, but most people do. And there's something you should avoid these type of things. As well. So there are type of numbers. So as I said, you can run this in the integers. There are specific in long integers defined with L at the end. So otherwise, integer is something that is, I don't know what the maximum is, but it's has a limit to upper and lower number. So, but, but, so there are, if you want to find something with 215 numbers, you can't do it as an integer, you have to do as a long integer. And of course, these calculations on these are much faster than on these. But you can do the calculations there also. Floating points, a floating point number is, I mean, in every computer, it's, it's, has a limited set of uh, uh, limited precision. You can't have 500 um, numbers after the comma because it's I mean, you only, you, it has a limited size basically. There are different sizes. So that's but but, but then you have a, you have a floating point part here that you can have it to be anything, but it did, you can't have something which has 500 characters to precision. And sometimes that matters, because sometimes actually the last part you lose is important, but you, you just have to know that. Uh, you can have octal and hexadecimal numbers, who knows that? You have even have complex numbers. And of course what you can do with these, you can add, subtract, multiply, etc. So, Guess for example, type uh, if you type uh, i equals five and z equals three, so you can separate. Oh, no, I did something wrong. Uh, how do you do that? Uh, go back, I mean. Oh, yes, move with the cursors. Oh, oh. This, this, uh, up here is just, it's just the arrows. Uh, this is just the arrows. 
Jeg har fingerbak som måste uh, ta det. Så so du kan type uh, x equals y plus z. And you should finish with uh, this. No? The y. Oh. Oh, it was a capital Y, sorry. See, I did a mistake here. Yeah. Then you type x. So you force you type uh, uh, x equals y times z and now x is 15 that's correct or you can do uh, x equals y divided by z what is that then? 1 because it's actually it's an integer I think I can do it another way I think I can do mm, no I think I'll do it like this Let's skip that because it doesn't work. I can do mm, x equals. I can take whatever is left when I do division, and then x is two. So I mean, you have one plus two parts are left. So I can, I can do things like that. So basically, any normal mathematical calculation I can do. Here it says what happens. Uh, I can only do things that are logic logics. I can, for instance, ask if x is equal to y, etc. So I, I can type. This is do with double x equal y, false. X equals two. It's true. So I can do things with that. Large n, the smaller n, not equal, I all, all these some things. And these kind of symbols there are kind of common in most computer languages. This is, I mean, it makes sense for mathematics. I can do and or or, so I can do any, any logical operator. So I can do x equals 1 and y equals 2. So then it's only true if both x is 1 and uh, uh, y is 2. So that's any basic normal logic. Uh, so here I may assume that x is 1, y is 4, z is 14. Is x more than y plus z? Yes. And actually, the, you have true has a value of 1 and false has a value of 0. And that's also, in principle, if you would like to do something else, you can do something else with it. If e, y equals this, no, it's not, etc. And you ask if x is not equal to y, then it's true. Because x not equal to y, because they're not the same. That's true. Uh, and then you can do these things like not, it's just inversion, so if x, x is not x x or y, this is if not x, not x is not bigger than 1, so not that is actually true, but not x, so not that is actually false, because then you have to do this not this x position here. And if this is both, this and or this one is true. But this is just basic no, no, log logics. So then you can start working on strings. So you can do um, my string equals classical computer example, hello world, that I can't spell. And if type uh, type just my string, it will tell you hello world. But if you type what is the first character in a string is of course character zero for compu logical computer reasons. And that is actually so that that's the string has a was support in it, so you can get the first character there is an H. The second one is a E. I can get the last one, which is minus one, it's a D. 
So you can do things like that quite easily. Mm. So minus one is the last one, minus two is the second to last one, etc. Things you can do that. You can do other things. You can do things like looking at the length for the string. So length my string. Hello. I can do hello. I can do hello. Hmm. A equals hello. B equals word. And do C equals A plus B. Now I'm not following the convention here. Right? I no, don't write long names there. And I do C. It's hello word. So I can do things. I don't think I can do any multiplication here. No. I don't know what that would mean. But I can do plus. So that, that's the kind of object oriented things. I can do plus on things that are actually are strings and also just plus. And I can do tests here also. I can do is word equal to hello? Is word equal to word? I can do there are substring things. I can look at does this string contain a word? Word, word, word? Is it uh, what position has? So there are a lot of commands on that you can do with strings. Like if you look at character, do I have this thing there? I can actually do it even check alphabetics on it. So is, is, the, is A less than B? Yes, it's true, but B is not less than A because A is before the alphabet. Uh, I can um, take up substrings, so I can take uh, uh, I draw my string my string. Colon two or two colon. I take everything from position three, etc. I can do two colon six and I get the part in the middle. So I can do a lot of these things. Well, you don't have to remember it right now, but I can also replace things. I can replace O to an O, so I'm going to spoon like that. I can take there's a there's a bit of uh, so this is now sort of looking at uh, so I, I, I can just start doing um, object orient object oriented things. This is upper is so my string is an object. I mean the string is an object, and I can use something that I work on this object. This called this is upper in this case, and it makes uppercase of it. I can do. Also replace, and I can do, uh, for instance, I can do uh, O comma K. Then we help him build. Is there a benefit of doing it that way instead of doing a uh, replace parenthesis and then uh, use the object you want to work on there, and then you write uh, the string in a comma? And then, oh, Not really. I mean, it's the same thing, I think. Uh, <coughs> I think I guess I should write like this then. Yeah, then comma. Yeah. And there's one to remember. Okay. You have to. Uh, I don't. I don't know if you need water. No, I mean. I don't know. That's uh, probably I use, I guess. No. It's called. Uh, I don't remember which called. It's not the thing. It's already an advantage of the first. Okay. Yeah, well, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I see the advantage. Yeah. It worked. Uh, <laughs> no, well, you, you can do it. But in principle, it's, it's the same. Th it, it will be the same thing. Right. 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 In fact, there are always these two things. You can put it as a dot at the end, or you can. Mm -hmm. but, uh, for my knowledge, they, they will do the same thing. Also, like uh, when you do the slicing, um, 
I think yesterday I could reverse my string by doing it within the brackets, colon, colon, minus one. And Probably a lot of tricks like that, yes. But I don't see the logic in it, because I see, like, I see if I go from a position, from the first position to the third position, and I only want to show that, but I don't see the logic in the colon, colon, minus one. I just found it online to be a, like, fast way to do it. Colon, colon, minus one. I don't know. No. No, the... Oh, if I do it. Maybe squared. Square brackets like that. Colon, colon, minus one. Yeah. There are some tricks. Um, there are, uh, yeah, I don't know why you want to reverse a string. But I, I <laughs> think the, the first position is the position where you start. Mm -hmm. The second is where you would like to end. And the second one is um, which stepwise yeah. do you would like to end. Okay, so yeah, so that's true. So, and, and then you just said um, start. from the... First to the last. And the step minus one. Yeah, so you can you you go back yeah, yeah. in your string. Yeah. So there's no logic. I mean, it, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, I mean, maybe it makes sense somehow, but it, 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 it's. I still don't see it, but mm -hmm. yeah, it, it, it works. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. there's, I mean, there's a lot of things you can do, and a lot of things. And somehow, obviously, keep it the way you know things and don't make things. I mean, there, there are sometimes people can make extremely fancy program doing things extremely compact. The problem is that it's often. I mean, it's very elegant, but it doesn't make readability the best, always. But I mean, if you want to reverse a string, otherwise you have to loop through it. It gets quite long complications. If you can do like that, it's much, much faster, much easier. You have lists, which is basically like a string, but every position in string is not just a <coughs> character. But it's a list of things together. So you're this is, these things are starting getting very, very useful in, in uh, bioinformatics because you really have. I mean, now you can think you have the name of a sequence, you have the sequences, you have the charge of it, and so you have it all together, and you have the smart lists. Uh, and you can ask, uh, do a lot of tests here, you can ask, of course, ask what is the entry in the string. Is B in my list? So basically, do we have a B here or not? Yes. You have an E, and you can add things and delete things opposed to it also. Even maybe may more important useful is even it was called um, dictionaries. Because normally, I mean, if you have a variable, this is so this is basically just a list of variables to put together. So you have like a position one, well, you have something in position one and something in position two, and also you have many, that's useful. Most cases you will have the same types here all, all over, but in dictionary you can have like a, a, a name that defines something that is a, as, as a variable name, and then it actually contains some information. So I, I can make uh, uh, probably if I call uh, my dict. and I have, I have the entry a here equals 56 uh, shouldn't be like that, sorry should be like this uh -huh. Why you should define the name that's what it says, right? it's not defined so it should oh. just say that it's mm. exists and then you can yeah I should define it like this How do I get the right key? Yeah. No? What if I turn pieces? Wow. This keyboard are always different. This should be, should be usually there. I think I can't do that. I didn't do a copy paste. Uh, great. Mm. 
Well, I think it's time. I think it's not the correct. I think it's just uh, I'm typing the wrong type of time. Oh yeah. Maybe inverted version. They're not the normal. Oh yeah, maybe that's. Yeah, these I these, these know, are maybe so some. Some doesn't copy paste and doesn't work. Yeah, that works. So yeah, it, there's some strange. Ca so now I can do. Uh, put this to A to T to six. I thought. So no. Oh, well, no, it's not sorry, I can I can do it. I can table this and it, it, it's four, yeah. This works. And I can tape change it to fifty six like that. So then, so then basically I have can have variables that are uh, variable names that are keys for my to the, to the dictionary. So this is very useful if you mean so basically I have a variable that contains all the information and the key sequence is the sequence of, of my gene for instance or the uh, charge or whatever feature I want to have it. So this is actually quite very useful and it, it's so that's something very commonly used in bioinformatics. So I, I can of course input or output. This is important very important in any programming language. I can read things and take away things. I can this I want to change things. I can do this use this integer float on my string and I can make it a float uh, integer. So I was that's how I tried to do it uh, So if I had this uh, x and or y and z, so type y divided by z, I get one. But if I do float y by my float z. I get it. So, I can, so that, that's so. If I take the floating point number, I get the floating point number. Then I get 1.7, one point six 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 seven. And then there are things you can do like that. But uh, th th so this is somehow you need to think what variable you have. So that, that is something you can make mistakes with. Most of the time it complains, but that's kind of important. So, as I said, so we will see if we just type the name of it, it types it out here afterwards. This is the raw input or raw output. And you can, uh, you can be reading data, for example, like that. There's a function print that actually prints things, and you can, I can have commas here, and it prints, uh, and make, if you want to avoid a new line, and just give, have an extra comma at the end. Uh, if you don't want a space in between, you make pluses. There are some of these. So there's a new line, there's no new line, and here is new spaces. So if you print hello world, we we'll print hello again. And you can go because of that, hello again. Print. Put uh, comma. What's the difference now? Yeah, put. Uh, It looks to me the same. Ah, oh, yeah, it was. No, there was a comma extra here. You see, that was the difference. I can do a, use four minus that. I can do a print hello, and then a variable percent s means it's a string, and then I use this cold and cruel words. Then a hello cold and cruel word. I can do it like that, and then I get. Space. Here you see how you say you get a space in this way: cool plus space plus and. So normally, when you write the program, you see I, I did things now just online here in my in the terminal. This of course is then of course I don't remember. Well, it's not why well, saved actually, but I, I can't reuse it. So often what you do is you enter the program in the editor. So I sign up an ed editor. And most editors that you use have actually very nice coloring things. They, they do things automatically. And but it's also so the, so comments is one code and the keywords are another code. So that doesn't that. And I, I normally use 
Emacs, but uh, the people do many different things, and they also have this automatic the, the indents, so basically you try to get things in the right place, the uh, right position. And as I said, in um, uh, in uh, Python, that's important because if you want a loop, you have to indent things in the right position. And if it doesn't do it, often that's because you have written something wrong and you code. So I don't know actually what editor is on the computer down there, but shows usually editor, don't use just simple text editor, use something that's very made programming. It makes life much easier. Okay, so at the end here I will talk about a little bit about BioPython, which is the Python module for doing bioinformatics. And as a lot of bioinformatics handles sequences. It actually has a lot, of, a lot of it is just to read and write sequences in different formats. It has also, as I said, functions to create a database of the network. So you really can ask databases of the network. So you don't have to, you can direct it from your language, you don't need to go to a web interface. And therefore, this, the good thing is that sometimes this, this interface is actually, I mean, they have, of course, this database have an interface to it. But it, it makes it very easy for people to use databases. So if you make a new database, you can just add you know, the feature to Python Py also. And also another big, big thing that has that is very common is the function is to parse the output. You run some program, or some SQL searching program or something, and actually you want to have it in a format so you can handle it easily all the output. And there are programs to do that. So everybody, or everybody mathematician has written at least five different blocks. Blocks is the most common search program blast parsers, because they never really, blast changes formats and you never really know how it works when there are five different output formats, etc, etc. So there are a lot of different things. If you use BioPython or BioPerl, something like that, you can actually, in most cases, just use it directly. And then nice, if you go to BioPython.org, there are a lot of nice tutorials and modules you can do a look at and have people do things. Uh, here's another other nice uh, tools sites for uh, different types of uh, Python modules. That you to, well, there are even more, this is a long list of things here. <coughs> so the Python modules, they are, this is probably out of date, but there are a lot of things you can do. So let's try some examples. So what you do, hopefully it works, I tried it yesterday at least, some of them. So you do from Bio, import, so this is, I use the bio module, and I want to import, import the sec io, so the sequence input output part of that. Hmm. I probably actually needed to have done one thing before, because I need to create a um, file. Um, I have, I don't see one thing, it's actually, where am I? I'm there. I don't know what I'm going to be. So there. So, uh, So, uh, my plan is to do open handle, which is something I need to open for handling files. And I type open. And this is Hopefully, I managed. Oh, sorry, I should have that also. But I didn't type it. No, I misspelled it. 
Let's assume that it works. So basically what you can do is that you can like should we have this file, you can read it in this format and you can print it. That may well it sh should be able to work it. Probably the wrong directory. Yeah, it's probably not there. Why is that there? I should do this. And I should do print sr.id. Oh, I made it this is something. Uh, for sr insect. Well, this one doesn't work. Next function may works. Hmm. So I, mean, I can do the same thing here, but we'll have a bank format instead. Instead of uh, the same thing again. So this should print the ID and things like that. Or in the uniform format. It's called Swiss here for some reason. But it's, this is much more interesting actually. Because this is I can get things in the network. This I tried yet, it should work. So do, uh, from bio import that's called m3 which is database entries um, and you just put an email address like med please 
دوباره 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 E fetch db equals nucleotide retype equals db comma id equals nm zero 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 five one eight If my internet is working, which it actually might be, it might be. So now it's trying to catch this data from the Antria database. Say, now it worked, yes. Uh, print sr point id. Oh, sorry, I forgot one, one line. SR equals seek IO and dot parse uh, real data in this case from the hand uh, comma it was gene bank format uh, dot next I think it will be great yes so now I get this is the ID I got. And the sequence I got is this one. So, so this I managed to down, now download it from the database somewhere. So let's not try more patch examples because it won't work. So this is so this is basically you can do straight off. You can get the sequence from the database. You can even do the same thing, but you can write it in some other format if you want to use the bank and save it in false format. So you can turn your, your database there and turn it into another format. Uh, you can use... Oh, right. Sometimes of course you need to write your own things, but for as much as you can use by Python, it's easier as long as it fits your needs. So as long as you do it, you should do it. Uh, Sometimes it's a good idea to try to extend these modules because you almost does what you want, but you want not really. You do things like that. But in general, probably just stick to what you have. And if you don't, if you don't have it there, you have to write it yourself. You can also do do things actually. This is like this is like an alignment. This is something we'll talk about later this week or next week. How do you find optimal alignment in these two programs? And these are this is a program called Smith Waterman, I guess. That is actually or it's called global here, so it's a uh, uh, program called align.global well, that is built into BiPython, so you can adjust this alignment by itself. So you write a small program that, uh, that uh, well, can do that and print out the alignment later. So you just do this here. Uh, you can do something, you can do something like calculate the charge, you have the charge amino acids here. Mm -hmm. And then you go go through your sequence and calculate what is some what is the total charge. Then there are a few things that, that, that you could think about when you start running the program. This one thing is actually to have some kind of version control. 
So basically, you want to keep your code and you want to know what you did six months ago. That's kind of very important because after you have something you've done and you forgot about it, and you want to see, and you, well, it worked six months ago, but it doesn't work today. So then, then it's good to be able to go back to see what you did six months. And nowadays, there's something called Git, which is called GitHub. It's a big hub for that, where you can deposit your code and you can get other people can read it and you can uh, use it for. Uh, uh, and you can look at how it looked like before. So, so that, that if you start anything bigger project, use something like that. You can use your own version of GitHub, or you can use Git, Git yourself, or you can use Subversion, the other version of that. But it is not for this really for this project in this course, but if you use something bigger, you should. And then there are of course a lot of things you can think about that will be important if you do big projects. Like how do you handle big data? There are a lot of new techniques coming out there. There are a lot of uh, hardware things that are changing in the world also. Because there are, as someone said, yeah, GPUs are getting much more faster, so people start using that. Okay, so that's the last slide. Do you have any questions? Or do you want lunch? So did you all get your cards, or did you? No. You probably, just probably tried to try to do that before the lecture. I don't know if they have lunch today, but you can knock on the door and see. They should be ready, Carl, all of you.